I tried optimizing my life. Here's what it taught me about my spirituality. But first, hi, if we haven't met, my name's Corey and I'm an ordained minister, church planter, and the pastor of RedeemerOnline.Church. And it's my goal to help you understand and practice the Christian faith, especially if you don't attend church right now. And if that's something you're interested in, you haven't done so yet, hit the subscribe button, the like button, and that notification bell, because that's gonna let you know whenever we put out new videos, and it'll let me know when you're here. And, and let me tell you, I'm so glad that you're here. All right, yes, I tried optimizing my life. In, in fact, I've tried and failed and tried and failed a lot of different times. Here's what I've noticed. Back in 2019, I started consuming and becoming obsessed with leadership development and self-improvement content. I spent every unoccupied moment listening to podcasts, reading books and blogs and audiobooks, and watching YouTube videos, all promising to help me optimize my life. And listen, I learned a ton of information about what my optimal life could look like, how, how to dial in my health and my schedule and my relationships, my work, my productivity, my finances, meal planning and parenting, organizational leadership, and even spirituality. I was learning so much and, and honestly, so much of it was so good, but there was a dark side to it all. I was learning a lot about what I could be, what I started to believe I, I should be. And, and all of that information fed the guilt and shame that was piling up about, about who I was, who I am. The guides to an optimized life became gods of oppression for me, constantly reminding me of, of who I'm not. And the hard lesson that I learned trying to optimize my life was that self-improvement without self-acceptance leads to self-destruction. In other words, trying to better myself because I hated myself didn't work nearly as well as, as trying to grow because I loved who I was. We know so much about the benefits of exercise, healthy eating, proper amounts of sleep. We, we've got all the time-saving devices in the world offering us every hack under the sun for optimizing our lives. Speaking of sun, have you gotten your morning sunlight in? This video, by the way, has been brought to you by Athletic Greens, now called AG1. No, I, I'm kidding, stupid joke. I, I knew all of the laws for optimizing my life, and it was still killing me. Listen, I'm not anti-self-improvement. I'm not anti-growth or productivity or really any of those things. The information wasn't the problem. The problem is my failure to become what the information required of me. I was never able to measure up. There's this relevant conversation that Jesus had with some of his audience. It's recorded in the Gospel of John. The whole interaction centers on this one statement where Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Which is a weird thing to say publicly, right? So what did he mean by that? Well, I, I think you can interpret it in three ways, which all point to the same destination. But first, let's add a little bit of context to the conversation. Jesus was having this almost dispute about his identity with a crowd of people. It's important to note that this crowd was predominantly, if not entirely, of Israelite descent. You know, the people who were led by Moses out of slavery in Egypt, those were these folks' ancestors. Now, this crowd of people came looking for Jesus because they had just seen or heard that he had performed a miracle where, where he turned a little bit of bread and some fish into enough food to feed over 5,000 people. And now they're back and, and they want to see more. And Jesus says, oh, you all just want more bread because I fed you, which is ridiculous. I mean, maybe that's why they sought him out, but I'm betting it had more to do with the miracle part. Then Jesus says, don't work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. Now, what you may not know is that these terms like food that endures, eternal life, Son of Man, they're all messianic eschatological terms. In other words, they're terms about the kingdom of God, this future utopia that this crowd of people were hoping for, a place where everything is as it ought to be, where everyone has exactly what they need, where God is king and all is right in the world. Now, Jesus' audience, knowing their own history, their own scriptures, they understood this immediately. Jesus was making a statement about life in that kingdom. So they asked him this probing question. What do you say God requires of us in order to live that kingdom life? 
And Jesus says, the work of God is that you might believe in the one he has sent. And in this moment, Jesus is making the claim that he's that messianic figure who's going to usher in the new utopia, the kingdom of God, that place where everyone can flourish, which is a wild claim. And so the crowd naturally demands, prove it, give us a sign. So, I mean, Moses gave our ancestors bread from heaven when they were in the desert, which is a reference to this Old Testament story where Moses and the newly freed Israelites are wandering the desert hungry. And so Moses goes to God and asks him for help. And God provides manna, bread, to fall from the sky and feed the people. So literally, physically, Moses gave us bread from heaven to sustain us in the wilderness. And Jesus responds and says, Moses didn't give your ancestors that bread from heaven. God did. And now I'm the new bread from heaven. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Here's what it means. First, it's a reference to the past. Bringing bread from heaven was what legitimized Moses to speak on behalf of God. It was the sign that he was God's representative on earth, which means that here Jesus is making the claim that now he has the authority to speak on behalf of God. This is a claim that he's eventually gonna get killed for. Second, it's a reference to the future. Bread that could feed people indefinitely in a way that they would never be hungry again is a reference to the idea of eternal life in the kingdom of God. Now, typically, this is what a lot of Christians think of as heaven, but that's not exactly accurate. And it's also not what the author of the gospel, Jesus, or the crowd would have had in mind when they heard this. They would have been thinking of life in the kingdom of God, that place and time where all is well and all will be well, that utopia where everyone has what they need. But in the crowd's mind, that kingdom was going to be established when the Messiah came and defeated the Romans and established the reality for them through force. Jesus, in their eyes, wasn't on that kind of mission at all. He wasn't a religious zealot, nor was he recruiting people for some secret anti-Roman military. And yet, in this claim, Jesus was saying, yes, I am that guy. I'm going to bring that future kingdom here. Third, it's a reference to their current reality. Bread of life is a metaphor here. Metaphorically, Moses also gave their ancestors bread from heaven that would sustain the good life. It's a reference to the law, think the Ten Commandments. Jesus' audience would have connected the idea of bread with the law of Moses. It was God's provision for how they could flourish both in this life and in the kingdom life to come. Feeding on the law like it was bread was the way you lived the good life. Just think about some of the Ten Commandments. No stealing, no killing, no unfaithfulness, no lying. Honor those who have gone before you. A life governed by honesty, integrity, faithfulness, honor, partnership, and community. The law was like the bread that sustained the good life. But here's the problem. Though it was instituted as an optimizing guide for the good life, it eventually became an oppressive God to which no one could measure up, which makes Jesus' statement all the more gracious and powerful. He corrects their interpretation, right? He says, oh, Moses didn't give you bread from heaven, but it's my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. To which the audience says, give us this bread always. Because they feel what I feel, maybe what you feel. The optimization game is rigged. Just because I know all the right information doesn't mean I'm capable of making the proper application. It, it simply ends up crushing me. Of course, I want the hack, Jesus. I want the info. I want to know that thing that's going to give me life because I've tried optimizing. Now I'm ready to opt for your flourishing instead. I want in on the utopia, the good life, the kingdom where everything is as it ought to be and everyone has what they need. Give me that bread always. Now this is really important. The crowd's likely expecting Jesus to give them an interpretation or a new set of laws. But Jesus just offers himself. He says, I am that bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. The good life is not something you have to optimize for. It's not an identity you have to achieve. It's something you can simply receive. So here's the question. What does it mean to receive it, to, to come to Jesus and believe in him? How would the original audience of the Gospel of John have heard those words? Well, later, the author actually repeats this idea at the end of the Gospel. He says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written 
that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. You know, belief's an interesting word. The Greek word is pisteo. It means to put your faith in or, or trust something or someone. Now, I think there's a difference between intellectually ascending to the idea of the existence of a thing and actually then trusting or putting your faith in that thing. Jesus in this conversation is inviting his listeners to trust that he was the son of God, come to establish the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven for everyone. But what does that trust look like? Well, I think it's not just about admitting the existence of something. Jesus was inviting his listeners to follow him to put his teaching to the test, put his words into practice and see for themselves whether or not it would lead to life, to a life of flourishing. A flourishing that they could experience in part now, but in full someday. And, and personally, I, I love this idea because I, I'm opting out of optimization. I, I wanna opt in on Jesus' version of flourishing, believing that Jesus was who he said he was, the bread of life, the one who secured divine love and forgiveness for everyone, including me, as I am, not, not as I could be or as I should be. And, and I'm going to trust that he's the one who, who talked about a future reality in which everything is as it should be, and everyone has what they need, which, which can give me hope when things are, you know, not what they ought to be in my direct vicinity. Now, what does that trust look like? Well, I think it means testing his words, words about love of neighbor, care for the poor and marginalized, about prayer, self-discipline, and generosity. It's about putting them into practice and finding out, does this truly lead to life, to the good life? Will it optimize? Maybe, maybe not. But will it lead to flourishing? I hope so. What about you? Have you tried the self-optimization route? Have you tried God's love and putting Jesus' words into practice? What have those options been like for you? Let, let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.